uh, believe it or not, 1982. So 19, one year before we started organizing conferences, uh, we were in the center of the of the town for 10 years in the palace. And then we went around to the best places. And uh, since uh, 2009, we are here every year. Uh, the point is that before we had the meetings every three years, let's say. But then I started to press to have uh, a permanent uh, institute here. And you cannot really, with buildings and so on, so you cannot press like that and say, I will come back in three years with my friends for a few weeks. So we started to establish every year uh, uh, long meetings, several meetings. <clears throat> and a few years ago, I managed to find the money for reconstruction of, uh, you see two of the buildings which are under reconstruction and another, there is another one, which is going to be used for us office space. So next time you come here, I hope that you have your office. You can work and then uh, you have as many meetings you want during the day and so on. Uh, this is how it goes. Uh, we have a, a good social program that you will see. It's better to see than describe. Uh, I hope you will all uh, dance in the Greek night. And that's uh, all I can uh, say for the moment. And we are here to help you in any difficulty. For the moment, maybe I should add on the practical side that we have a list in case you uh, who want to have a, a lunch a outside. Uh, by the way, in the whole area, there is a beach. The palace had a beach, of course. And uh, so you can swim there. You can go with uh, your lunch basket. Uh, you pay just uh, six euros for that, uh, but you put your name so that we order it. I think that's enough for the moment, and Andy, please start. <laughs> well, let me also extend a very warm welcome to all of you who have made it here to this wonderful and historic place. Um, so this conference is supposed to be a cozy, informal, asking lots of questions conference, and so Hopefully uh, you'll do that throughout uh, the talks that will take place in the mornings and then also the discussion sessions which we have in the afternoons. And we're very happy to kick off this week um, with uh, Andy Strominger, who will tell us about, I guess, top-down uh, holography. Holography beyond ADS. Holography beyond ADS. OK, great. Okay, and I I go for um, I go till ten thirty, right? That's the yeah. Okay. Um, so there's been, uh, as everybody who he is here knows, there's been a lot of uh, excitement in the general field of uh, celestial holography, and. Um, in particular, I guess there's been in the last few months, a lot of progress. Uh, the program originally started in a sort of top, bottom up uh, type mode where we started from what we could ascertain from low energy laws of physics and how we might constrain a celestial duel. And more recently, there's been some interesting though still incomplete um, uh, progress on going the other way, starting from some uh, microscopic theory and constructing a celestial dual, uh, which would of course generally be more restricted in a, a applicability than the real world. It would be some kind of subsector of, of the real world. But um, I'm gonna sort of back up in this talk. Um, I'm, I guess I'm le also leading a discussion session at the end where I would imagine we're likely to get into mo more of those to topics, but I'm gonna uh, back off and try to talk more generally about some problems that we would like to solve in theoretical physics in which uh, you know celestial holography seems to sit in the middle of, but doesn't completely um, occupy. So one of the goals, of course, of 
celestial holography is to take all the fantastic amount we've learned from ADS holography and adapt it in some way so that we can apply to the real world that uh, we, we live in. I know many of us, many of us exciting as ADS and string theory and all that is, it, it, can, be, um, it can be tiring after a period of decades to you know, have no uh, contact with, you know, direct contact with uh, ideas that are directly relevant to the real world. And I don't think we're very far from the real world. Of course, that's what sustained us uh, in, in our studies of string theory and ADS, that we were talking about ideas who were, uh, that were closely relevant to the real world, though not exactly the real world because of various assumptions we made that precluded the real world. But I think we can drop those. And, um, and, and uh, it's, it's a good time to do that. Um, but a slightly different question, making contact with the real world, is understanding what holography is. What is holography? Well, in my view, the first person to really talk about holography was Bekenstein, in which he said that the entropy of a black hole uh, was proportional to the area. And one naturally thinks of uh, entropy is proportional to bits, and you, the number of bits that you could put on the area of a black hole is, of course, proportional to the area divided by the size of the bit. And so that was a very surprising and weird example. One might have expected uh, instead that the entropy would be proportional, as it is with a star, or proportional to um, the volume of the star. And um, the notion of holography got generalized in very many ways uh, from there. Um, lots of papers on the holographic, early papers on holography and flat, flat space, holography and college, cosmology, most of them demonstrably wrong, had very simple counterexamples, but nevertheless, um, you know, sort of reaching out, exploring in, in, uh, in an interesting direction. And then, um, well, maybe I should say what I mean by holography. And I'm not really sure what I mean, but let me try to say something that might not be proved demonstrably long in a short period of time. Uh, the basic idea is that you have a bulk theory of which includes in which the metric is a dynamical variable that's quantized, a bulk theory of quantum gravity, and it's shown to be identical to some theory which we'll just call a boundary theory, but we're not going to say what the boundary is, which is just some, some kind of quantum field theory without gravity, usually in fewer dimensions. Now, there are many ways that that can happen. And um, in ADS, though, um, one of the surprising things, as soon as you see this, is that, yeah. Say what? Uh, what I mean by identical, um, yeah. So what, simply what I mean by identical is anything we can compute on the left, we can also compute on the right. That's all I mean, nothing profound. Uh, it's a practical statement. Um, so, uh, and vice versa. Okay, so the example that we understood in ADS uh, had, uh, the very simplest possible form of that, where you literally had a space with a boundary, anti de Sitter space has a boundary, and the quantum theory lives in the bulk, and the quantum field theory lives on the boundary. 
And I think it's pretty clear as we've gone on that whatever we need, it's gonna be a little bit more complicated than that. Um, more things are gonna get jumbled up. So, <clears throat> and involved. And so we don't have a recipe book, but we do have um, a cast of characters. But these characters play different roles in different um, kinds of holography. Um, well, there's um, there's uh, asymptotic symmetries on boundaries. All of these play some roles in ADS, but their relative roles, uh, I think, will get. Um, they're versatile actors, and they play relative different roles in different constructions of holography. Uh, various different kinds of notion of emergent space-time. Have appeared. Um, event horizons. Event horizons, which I would include cosmological horizons and black hole horizons. Um, Ryu Takenagi surfaces, which are various minimal surfaces, which we could just call various extramal surfaces in the space time. Um, <clears throat> the notion of a holographic screen Um, I want to add here phase space. So in ADS, um, we have, well, this one doesn't really enter in phase space. Holographic dual, uh, both, the, both sides of the correspondence live on space time. It's just that one space time is the boundary of another space time. But in general, in quantum mechanics, we can do canonical transformations between P and Q. There isn't much difference between them. And um, we might expect, and there have been indications of this in various calculations, that we ha have to think more generally about uh, phase space, that um, the holographic dual might live you know, in momentum space on one side and uh, in regular space on, on, on the other side. Another thing which has been coming a lot is twister space. So I think it was really, <clears throat> you know, many of us have you know, gone through uh, periods where every few years we realize some, something and then realize that Penrose said it like in the 60s, but maybe never found its right context. But, um, but twisters, were very much an attempt to be uh, to do holography. They wanted to reconstruct all of space-time from Scry Plus, and they believed that um, points were not the fundamental. I mean, that is what we're saying in ADS holography: that points are not fundamental. It's boundary points that bulk points are not fundamental. It's boundary points that are fundamental, and um, and and Penrose was saying something simple. Sim Similar, it was twisters that are fundamental and, and they have a, a, a boundary-like uh, aspect to them. And indeed, I think we're, we've been rediscovering that a lot of what was said by Penrose is more relevant, not to ADS holography, but more relevant to uh, flat holography than we might have anticipated. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, um, <clears throat> one thing that plays an important role in, in um, the original, certainly in Maldacena's original construction was the idea of a near horizon region. And the near horizon region is a region in space time. But there are several, and, and once you have the, the symmetries in the near horizon region, there's some more steps to getting some kind of duality. But um, there are some examples that we have now, one that I'm going to discuss, the photon ring, um, and one uh, that Castro, Maloney, and I discussed later, where you have emergent symmetries. But the, the scaling regions are regions of phase space, not of space time. Uh, and somehow that never happens in ADS. And, and ADS is wonderful, but it's very much like looking under the lamppost. There might be other kinds of um, generalizations that we need to we need to think about. There's there's no logical contradiction in my mind of if if uh, holography looks more natural after d doing some canonical transformation. <clears throat> Okay, um, so what I'm gonna do, and so I, I, while I just said it, I'm gonna introduce at the end of a talk, a new character, the photon ring. And I'm certainly not uh, claiming to assemble the cast here. Um, I just think it's, I think it's something that uh, cholesterol, you know, it's not good to just sit around and, you know, stare at your navel and think about deep ideas, it's good to calculate. Um, but it's also not good to just calculate and not think about things uh, more generally. And so I'm just trying to throw all this out. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make some general comments about the structural holography. So in understanding celestial holography, it's clearly different from ADS holography. It's co-dimension two, not co-dimension one. And you, one of the directions you lose is the time direction. And um, what are the rules about that? When do we lose the time direction? When do we, you know, when is it co-dimension one? We don't know. Uh, we've got something that seems to work. So there are a few other examples that I think are good to think about. And I'm gonna talk about ADS, DS, Minkowski space, uh, Klein space and a little bit about black holes and flat space, which I think are a very different animal than black holes in ADS space. There's been an enormous amount recently about ADS, uh, ADS and uh, black holes in ADS and all the islands and so forth. And none of that applies to uh, black holes in, in flat space, which are really qualitatively different. Okay. Uh, any questions? They would say it. I've asked them in talks and they can't explain it. So I, I, I am on the record in many places as disagreeing with it. Okay. So, um, Let's see, so let's first talk. So I'm gonna talk about ADS, nice big whiteboard here. Uh, DS, uh, Minkowski space, and Klein space, how holography works. So let's first talk about operators. So in ADS, now this is always a little hard in ADS because it's hard to draw the boundary without drawing the bulk, but this is supposed to be drawing of just the boundary. Is there another color here? Uh, 
Okay, so if we want to talk about operators in the boundary, we just pick some points and um, going around the back here, just go around the boundary, let them interact somewhere. And that's how you compute boundary correlators. Now, if we want to do. Thank you, thank you. So important. This is time here. And this is uh, space here. So it's just ADS looks like a cylinder. Um, well, it can be any number. But let's think about uh, ADS three, so that the so that the um, interior, so that so that the boundary is a one plus one dimensional conformal field theory, and the bulk, the slices along here, are just uh, hyperbolas, are three three dimensional hyperbolas. Now, if we want to compute the same thing, um, so many colors here. If I can remember, let me try. Um, blue for the bulk. If we want to compute it in the bulk, we just go in. We don't have to stick to the boundary. We just go in and we do some sort of bulk. I can look at it at the interior of your object that is the bulk. The interior of this is the bulk. Sorry, let me draw a, a separate picture of it. And let me draw these lines to indicate that it's filled in. And then the bulk correlator, instead of having to go into the boundary, we use some bulk propagators that just directly cross the bulk. And these things are equal. And statements like this have been shown to really crazy accuracy in all kinds of different circumstances. Yeah, 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 yeah. I like to my the analogy I like to use is like a Campbell soup can. If you want to know what's in it, you can just read the ingredients on the boundary. That's the boundary description, or you can open it and eat it. But then the correspondence between these points is not natural. No, no, because. We, we are only allowed, even in the bulk, the points must be on the boundary. And the logic for that is that there are no observables associated to points in the bulk because there's quantum fluctuations of the metric. And the rules for the path integral is that the metric doesn't fluctuate on the boundary. No diffeomorphism invariant observables in the bulk. You're right to be unhappy about that, but but that that is, and it, to the extent that you have diffeomorphism invariant invariant observables, you can you have to be able to reconstruct them from boundary observables. And there's a long thousands of papers on how you go about doing that. Well, diffeomorphism non-invariant observables would tend to be zero after you integrate overall diffeomorphisms. And they don't correspond to any physical measurement and they may depend on what gauge you do the calculation in. So we're generally not interested in them. Well, what you would say, uh, what what you, what you would say, and this is not completely uh, unsatisfactory. What you would say, I think, is that the observer, everything really lives on the boundary, but certain combinations of things on the bulk, on the boundary, are are effectively projected into the bulk, and can 
to a great deal of approximation, and indeed exactly in the classical limit, look as if they are in the bulk. But ultimately to have an exact quantum mechanical, you know, strong coupling observer, you need to pin it to the bulk. Now this gets very hard to the boundary. This gets very hard in systems where there aren't boundaries. Yeah. But suppose we have in mind that when we in any so far applied physics, we have always been thinking of making a choice of the gauge of the in the bulk, and we have always been somehow understood, yeah, we choose some gates and then we can make some uh, some measurements and things in the in the bulk. That's what we that's what we used to that's what we used to think. That's not what we're thinking now. Oh. Now is that we can define the things on the boundary. I think what we used to think is that we would try to define things exactly in the bulk, but what we define would necessarily involve a gauge choice and um, exactly what it is would depend on that gauge choice. Now I, now I would say in ADS, we think about it a little differently. We uh, define it on the boundary, uh, hope that it, try to construct it, you know, use things like the Penrose Critchover map and so on, and try to describe it in such a way that it, it quote, would, in some classical limit, correspond to exactly something on the bulk, on the on the boundary, and then it is whatever it is um, when you go away from uh, the classical limit. So you can you have a choice. You can have things which are exactly defined, even when all perturbation theories are turned on and are gauge invariant, or you can have things but not, might not correspond intuitively to a localized observer or somehow carry some other, uh, or you can have things whose definition depends on some gauge choice. And then uh, maybe you can make it look more like an absorber, but maybe not. It's exceedingly difficult to, to take anything of what to know and do today and Put it into a completely requirement sensation environment again in, in, in general relativity because you can't even tell where in space time you are and, and, and you will you will not know if it is this. So just to tell where you are, you will have to, to give some uh, recognition. Here I see that church to this. Number of things so, this it, reminds it, me of people it, in the night. This reminds me of people in 1930 who said it's exceedingly difficult to measure the position and the momentum of a particle exactly. There's some things you just can't do in physics. And, and that's what we and, and having something like ADS where where we can control it exactly gives us a good gives us a good sense in that. Okay, let me go on. I haven't gotten very far. Oh no, okay. All right. Um, um, okay, so to center space. So all this is is pretty well accepted. Uh, it, it's a construction in mathematical physics and uh, it embodies what we would like to think of as holography that we start out with some theory which lives on the boundary, the surface of the can here and the interior in there. Now we'd like to extend it to four other things, the sitter space, Minkowski space and Klein space, where um, uh, uh, Klein space is Minkowski space with two comma two signature. So in the sitter space, the, uh, the boundary uh, is uh, depending on whether there's a big bang or not, there's a boundary in the um, far future. And in the case of our own boundary, we believe that that boundary is uh, S3. And um, if we want to compute correlation function in the boundary, uh, 
DSCFT, which is sort of a continuation of uh, ADSCFT, posits that those correlation functions are correlation functions in some conformal field theory. And then in the bulk theory, we would instead have uh, some correlation functions, the same correlation functions on the boundary, but we could compute them exactly by um, cor correlation functions that go into the boundary. So this one is very much like DSCFT in the sense that the boundary is co-dimension one. And I wanna come back later to how we're supposed to think about this second boundary. Um, the boundary is co-dimension one and um, the boundary correlators are given by bulk correlators. Of course, there's a main uh, difference here that the emergent direction is, is, is time, the holographically reconstructed dimension is time rather than, than, um, than space. And in, and in this case, there are sort of a plethora of examples where we could compute things um, in many examples. And in this case, there's really only one example, the Vasily of SBN theory, where we can show that there's an exact duality, which is comforting, which because it shows that the idea is sort of mathematically consistent, but it's a pretty weird example. And so we don't we don't have anywhere near as much um, confidence in that as we do in um, now coming to the, as in the ADSCFT example. So <clears throat> now coming to Minkowski space, the Holesville solography program shows that you can uh, compute uh, correlators in a boundary. So let me write what this would be. This would be, uh, S2 cross R, this would be R3 cross R, this would be S3, this would be, uh, you know, topologically R4, and, or top, sorry, topologically S3 cross R, and this would be um, S2, and then this is, uh, holographically dual to a situation where we compute a scattering amplitude, which, um, which goes into the bulk. And here, um, so here there are a lot of difference. This, this, so first of all, um, and this is M4, Here, there are a lot of differences with ADS space. And what I'm suggesting here is we should find some kind of pattern or some way of thinking about what holography is in which each of things is a special case. It shouldn't be on a case by case basis. And there are also more space times, the C metrics, there's, there's uh, all kinds of space times that we encounter in GR. And, if we fully understood the holographic principle, we should be able to uh, apply our, our, our knowledge to all of them. So what's different about this one? Now, this one is unlike this one, is known to work for any example in the sense that if you're given this, you can do some Mellon transforms on it and rewrite the things and rearrange it and put it in this form. That's different from what we can do in ADS where we can either start here or we can start here. 
and we can get one to go to the other. Um, now, what it, some of the exciting things that's happened in the last sort of six months is that we have begun to find sort of toy examples where we can start from two dimensions and see uh, Minkowski space um, reconstructed. Not realistic world examples, but sort of special quasi topological examples. Okay, now what's surprising about this is several things. <clears throat> the holographic screen is co-dimension two, and um, the uh, so this is two dimensions and four dimensions, whereas there we had four dimensions and three dimensions, and we lost two directions, a space direction and a time direction, and there are uh, actually this sphere really is a celestial sphere that lives here, but there are two of them. And a careful analysis of the boundary conditions that one uses for ordinary scattering processes in Minkowski space tell you that the conformal structure, these are all, in all cases, these are conformal spheres. They don't have a metric on them. They only have a conformal structure. The conformal structure on this sphere and on this sphere together by the boundary conditions at infinity and Minkowski space. So we can think of them as, um, we, we can think of them as, do I have red? No red, okay. We can, we can think of them as um, both of these, the incoming sphere that tells you about the incoming objects and the outgoing sphere that tells you about the outgoing the outgoing objects all live uh, on the same two sphere um okay so this certainly is possible the question is not as whether it's correct or not um but whether it turns out to be useful or not i mean ads has has turned out to be extremely useful in the sense that many things about the bulk that we could not understand, we were able to learn by computations at the boundary and um, extrapolating them to the bulk. And many things about the bulk that we could not understand, we, we learned uh, about the boundary that we could not understand, we learned by extrapolating uh, from the bulk. Here, there are clearly many things about the bulk that we don't understand. What should quantum gravity at four-dimensional asymptotically flat Minkowski space look like? And we're hoping that we can, we can grab some of those from the boundary analysis, uh, though, though that hasn't happened yet. Okay, now, interestingly here, I've drawn two different colors of crosses. So uh, in these two different colors of crosses, some come from the past, some come in the future, but as I just explained, they both belong on the same sphere. Now let me go to the interesting case of Klein space. So Klein space, why should we talk about Klein space? Well, we're used to in quantum field theory, talking about Minkowski space and talking about Euclidean space, where we change the signature from three, one to one, four, to, to, three, one, two, four, zero. And we do that because in Euclidean space, we get many positivity properties, many expressions become simpler and so on. But it has the problem that in Euclidean space, nothing can be on shell. And so if we compute Euclidean diagrams, we compute many on physical diagrams, continue them to Minkowski space, and all the unphysical stuff has to cancel out. That means that Feynman diagrams based on Euclidean space are uh, extremely efficient. Do they uh, contain an overwhelming amount of information that is doomed to cancel out? Um, the interesting physics.
OK, so um, in Klein space, uh, there's no difference between past and future because you can take any time-like uh, vector and turn it backwards by an SO2 2-com rotation. And the Penrose diagram looks like this. It's a triangle where, where this is time and this is space. And there's only one asymptotic infinity. And here in Minkowski space at asymptotic infinity, there was a sphere, the celestial sphere. But weirdly, and this is explained in this paper by uh, Ed Tanasanov, uh, Bull, uh, Reclario, and AS, um, at each point you have a torus. And so this is kind of a toric Penrose diagram where uh, the cycle of the one cycle of the torus generates here and the other cycle generates here. So the whole thing falls together into uh, an R4. And in Klein space, we only have one region and um, we have both the in and the outs uh, represented in this region. So uh, if we want to do the boundary calculation, we have a two-dimensional Lorentzian torus. We um, specify points on that torus and compute correlation functions in a two-dimensional uh, conformal field theory or equivalent. Well, let me talk about states in a second. And that contrasts with the boundary computation where since there's only one boundary, everything has to scatter into nothing. So instead of having an S matrix inclined space, you have an S vector um, and, the, and the allowed uh, scattering states that travel non-trivially non are, are, um, are those that can annihilate. Well, if you just take one particle and send it in, it will do something like this and come back out. So you'll get, you'll, you'll get two particles. That's a trivial scattering process. Okay, so th this is the basics of how the holographic dictionary works uh, in these three cases. Uh, how many minutes do I have? Zero minus five. Okay, I'm going to skip the. I'm going to. I'm going to just say three words. I'm just going to say three words about uh, the photon ring, but but let me say something about um, emergent space time, which I which I think is 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 pretty interesting. So um, the idea of emergent space time, of course, here you have it that the bulk uh, emerges from the interior, but that's a little uh, unsatisfying because okay, the bulk states are equal to the boundary states, and um, the, the more interesting thing is the old Maldacena thermal double. Where you, so, so somehow what should happen is that you have your boundary fields theories and you put them together in, in some way. And depending on how many components you have, you can get different regions of emergent space time. So what, what, sorry, there's no dashed line along there. So what Maldacena said is we take two copies of the CFT, one that lives over here and one that lives over here. And if we took either one of them alone, we would just get a single space time whose boundary was a cylinder. But if we take two of them and we put them in a thermal field double state, e to the minus b, beta e. So this whole row, the top row was boundary, bulk, and now we're talking about emergent. e to the minus beta e i sum over i psi i psi i. We make a so-called thermal field double state, a pure state on here. And uh, these can be thought of as states in the conformal field theory because 
states in the bulk are identified. But if we take this doubled state in the conformal boundary conformal field theory, it emerges, a re, it, it creates a region of space time. The correlations induced by this density matrix, well, it's not a density matrix, it's a thermal field bubble, um, produce the throat between these two regions. So this is a very concrete example in which we can see the throat region, the Einstein-Rosen bridge region of two black holes emerging from quantum correlations between two conformal field theories. Here we would also like to see, roughly speaking, there's a CFT plus. We'd also like to, to see that E to the minus, the temperature is probably two pi L naught, psi k one, psi k two, that that should enable us to reconstruct uh, the de Sitter geometry. And moreover, in this case, if you take the trace over one side, you get the hartle hawking density matrix on here. And similarly on here, um, if you take the, the, the trace on one side, you should be able to get the hartle hawking wave function on the de Sitter space. We haven't succeeded in doing this, but we think it's possible. I've been working with Jordan on this. Now, similar things are, are true here. So in Minkowski space, actually, we have two, two states, in and out. And there's a natural double of those. We can call the state S, which is the S matrix, S alpha beta, psi out alpha, psi out beta. And this is a thermophile double state. And there should be some sense in which all of Minkowski space uh, emerges from, um, from, we can think of it as emerging from this double in the space of states. Now, this is more interesting, I think, to think about when you go to the CFT dual. So what are states in the CFT dual? Oh, also I should have said over here, what are states in here? So states in here, if we take the boundary, we have a CFT, we take a point in the boundary and we take a two sphere around it and we get a state psi i associated say with some operator in the origin, we get a state psi i in the CFT. So, um, this thermal field double should be states associated with operators of those kind. Similarly here, it's very interesting. If you look at uh, scattering in Minkowski space, um, then you're scattering from the past, bulk states from the past to the future. And this was discussed in a paper by Crawley, Miller, Melton, and myself. You start out in the bulk stu studying states which go from the past to the future, but then this S matrix is represented by uh, some correlation function on the sphere in the celestial dual. And in the celestial dual, if you were to think about this as a matrix element, you would take the sphere and you would cut it in half and you would think of it as the quantum state on this sphere, the interlap between the quantum state on this sphere and the quantum state on this sphere. And that, so this sphere is everything that's on the north side of the space. And this sphere, north, north, south, and this sphere is everything that's on the south side of the space, roughly speaking. So in this calculation, what you're doing is you're completely reorganizing the S matrix. Instead of saying that you want to study given a state in the past, 
what is the state in the future? The question that you naturally ask in celestial uh, conformal field theory is a completely different one. Given the state on half of scry minus and the state, let me draw it over here. Given the state here, psi uh, past in the south, and the state here, psi future and the north, that's the same thing as being given half of one of these spheres. Suppose you know this and you know this, what happened here? So it's a very interesting reorganization of the scattering process. And indeed we know if we send a particle in here and it comes out here with a phase shift, we know that it passed something in here. So this celestial field theory uh, rewriting is telling us um, you know, to reconsider the way we think about scattering processes in space-time. And the way that we think, of, put another way, the opposite way, the way we think about scattering in space-times is not the one that's naturally presented uh, in the celestial dual. And indeed, the one that is naturally presented in the celestial dual may have various kinds of properties and so on, which enable one to uh, constrain its form uh, with, 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 with less work. And okay, uh, I better stop, but the problem gets even more uh, interesting when you, when you go to, to, to Klein space. And finally, I want to say that um, there's another character that we just wrote a paper on, and I prepared two pages to, to talk about it, uh, namely the photon ring that um, sits outside uh, the black hole. And it also appears to be some kind of uh, holographic screen who, that, uh, whose properties we don't fully understand. Okay, so I hope I succeeded at talking for an hour about things I know nothing about. Much Andy for this uh, wonderful introduction of cast of characters and set uh, setting the stage. Um, we have some time for questions before we we'll move on to the next talk. Don't be shy. Yeah, yeah. So, so in the um, in the amplitudes program. Um, or in many, in many texts on quantum field theory, one often finds that, that, that um, a lot of progress is made by treating spinners and conjugate spinners as independent. You don't need to vary them separately. For example, if you write your momentum P, P alpha alpha dot equals P mu, gamma mu alpha alpha dot, then it becomes a bi-spinner. And it's often very useful to vary those two components of the bi-spinner completely uh, uh, independently. And, and um, th that's like varying Z, making Z and Z bar independent. And um, something mathematicians all, often do. And doing that, <clears throat> if you do that, in effect, you're going to Klein space. And um, uh, because in Klein space, uh, the, 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 sp the group of spinners, in, in, in Lorentzian space, the Lorentz group is SL2C. So the spinners transform in their doublet and their complex conjugates. And in Klein space, uh, the, the, the isometry group is, is SO22, S, which is SL2R squared. And so the spinners are just completely independent. So uh, it's my view that most of the papers on amplitudes, um, which have developed an extraordinary number of powerful results about the, about the um, properties of 
scattering amplitudes, you know, all kinds of theories are, are largely in Klein space, not in Euclidean space. When you go, and in particular, if you want to build up scattering amplitudes from minimal on-shell components, um, you, you need to be in Klein space because in Euclidean space, um, there's, no such, there's no such thing as, as on-shell. So we thought rather than sort of implicitly working in Klein space, one should um, understand it explicitly what Klein space is. And it turns out that Klein space is a, is a very interesting place with a non-trivial causal structure. And it says that the dual, the, the dual of, um, if you have a dual in, in Minkowski space, the dual lives on two celestial spheres, but these celestial spheres are really joined into one. And in Klein space, what you have is instead a celestial torus. You find that infinity is described by a torus, but, this, but if you want to continue back to Minkowski, Minkowski space, let me draw the torus like this where you identify the top and the bottom and the sides. So to continue back to Minkowski space, you have to decide what time is. You have to choose one of the two time directions as time. And that amounts to choosing a diamond on the celestial torus. And so the celestial torus, you can see there's two diamonds. And one of these diamonds is you analytically continue using this choice of time back to Minkowski space. One of these becomes the past celestial sphere and the other one becomes the future celestial sphere. And um, in the Minkowski case, you have this sometimes annoying feature that a free particle comes and ends the same point on the celestial sphere. So the operators, at every point, there's two operators, the in operator and the out operator. And in Klein space, the, the in operator and the out operator live on opposite points in the celestial sphere. And they have the property that they lie within each other's light cones. Those are some basic interesting properties of, of Klein space. Yes. In the flat space? Well, um, so let's see. Uh, I'm not sure that this, the space is, is not entangled. So a, a familiar example of that, it's more of a question of whether it's a good idea to think of the space as entangled, whether it's useful. So for example, if we go back here, of course, this state is not entangled. The, the, it's, not, it's not, if you look at the full Hilbert space on this slice, the Hartle-Hawking vacuum is not an entangled state, it's a pure state. This is a pure state. However, um, what I've written here is it's a product, entangled product state of the left Hilbert space and the right Hilbert space. So if we trace out the right Hilbert space, we get a density matrix. Um, now in Minkowski space, so um, um, similarly, we think something similar might be true in the sitter space. And in Minkowski space, I think, um, yeah, if you take the S matrix, you have an in state and an out state. Uh, if you trace over the either one of them, you get an entangled state. And um, moreover, um, a, 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 a other things to think about here, the S matrix is rather different in the um, celestial basis in the in from this point of view of the celestial sphere. So if you trace over the right half of the sphere, you, you will get an entangled state. If you trace over the right half, you'll get an entangled state. 
in the left half. And moreover, in Minkowski space, of course, we're used to thinking of the Minkowski space as the a pure state. You know, uh, however, you can write it as an entangled state in the Rindler basis. That's familiar. And indeed, the, the Rindler states are eigenstates, they're boost eigenstates, which is what we talk about when we go to, um, you know, the, the, the states, <coughs> the modes of the unentangled picture of Minkowski space are <coughs> Minkowski modes. And the, um, uh, but it's natural from <coughs> the celestial point of view to think about boost eigenstates. And so it seems to me quite possible that um, there's a good way of thinking about, from the point of view of celestial physics, of thinking about even Minkowski space as a kind of entangled state. And <coughs> as Minkowski space itself is something which is emergent from the celestial, the states in the celestial conformal field theory of, um, of, uh, of the celestial CFT, in the same sense that uh, in the Rindler base, Minkowski space is emergent. Well, if you set the, if you set the temperature to zero, these states disentangle. Yeah. But what's different about this example is that there's a parameter that you can vary. Uh, in, you know, there's no, in Rindler Minkowski, the Rindler temperature is one over two pi, and uh, you can't set it to zero and find a limit 